chain is the correct length. <laughs> Welcome. My name is Rindu Bardwaj and I'm the publisher of Young Street Media. Thank you for joining us this evening for our speaker series event, which is sponsored by the Toronto Community Foundation. We have some of our Young Street team here as well, who I'd like to introduce. Paul Blatt, our managing editor. Hamacho Dotan, our innovation and job news editor. And Tanya Titiana, our photographer. And from Detroit, our group publisher, Ashley Edema. We're happy to welcome back our facilitator for these talks, Peter McLeod, who's the principal of the Toronto Strategy and Engagement Company, Mass LVP. Mass LVP is an innovative firm. It's an innovative firm that's reinventing public consultation, and Peter is definitely one to watch. I'm going to actually now hand it over to Peter, and he's going to introduce our panelists and our format for this evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone to this town hall, the University of Toronto, for this evening's presentation. I've got with me two people. I have to confess right away, I'm big fans of both of them. I get to introduce them to you in a moment. Rabul, of course, is going to talk about uh, the recently released, just last week, Vital Signs 2012 report. Mary Rowe is in from New York. She's going to share some of her thoughts on this year's findings and also her experience in the U.S. We're going to banter back and forth a little bit here, and then we're going to turn to you for questions. And then we've got a challenge with which we're going to end this evening. And uh, we're going to ask you to, to help us think about some of the ways in which we might get Torontonians really focused on the significance of some of the biggest indicators shaping life here in the city. So with that, let me introduce to you uh, Rahul Barjwad. As you know, he's the president and CEO of Toronto Community Foundation, a one-time corporate lawyer at a leading Canadian law firm. Uh, many of you will remember that he was also the Vice President of Toronto's bid for the 2008 uh, Olympics. Uh, he has the uh, uh, special uh, experience these days, I guess, of sitting on the board of Metrolinx. We're going to be talking about transit, of course, this evening. And he's been involved with the uh, boards of the Stratford Festival of Canada, the United Way, George Brown College, uh, Downtown Jazz Festival here in Toronto, and the Ontario Summer Games as well. You got some bling this year when you were awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for the work that you've been doing for the city, so congratulations on that. Uh, city next to me, Mary Rowe, uh, currently Vice President of Strategy and Partnerships for the Municipal Arts Society of New York City, one of the oldest civic organizations in the United States, founded in 1893. Uh, but even though she's working at the heart of all things civic in New York, she is uh, in her heart very much still a Torontonian. Uh, many of you will remember that Mary was the president uh, who created uh, the fantastic uh, 1996 summit and program, Ideas That Matter, which was all about celebrating the legacy of Jane Jacobs. Uh, since then, she's been down in New York doing very important work with the New Orleans Institute for Resilience and Innovation, which of course was there to try and respond to the systemic collapses following Katrina in 2005. So, delighted to have you back in Toronto for the evening, Mary. And Rahul, we're going to turn to you because, I mean, anyone who's looked at this thing, 240 pages, it's a lot to get through. Housing, transit, the economy, education, soup to nuts account of where we're at in the city. You say, not too bad this year. Tell us more. So we boiled it down to a nice, pithy statement and called it not too bad. Am I on yet? How's that? How's that? So hear the gravelly voice now. Uh, so we're going to go on a little bit of tour of Toronto today. It's an important story about Toronto for Toronto. And I hope you're going to learn something about the city that you didn't know before. But to kick things off, I want to do an informal poll. Please put up your hand if you want to be happy. <laughs> you are in the right room this evening. That's a good start to the evening. And I'm going to connect happiness with the Vital Signs Report uh, a little later on. But I want you to keep that theme at the front of your mind. Now, theme of not too bad. Uh, about 1980s, I came to U of T, and I was in fact a graduate of Venice College, so it's kind of nice to come home in its own right. 
But when I came here, I remember talking to somebody and saying, so how are you doing? I said, not too bad. I kind of looked at him and said, what does that mean? Not too bad. A little bad? A little good? Not too bad? What are we talking about? So over the 30 odd years that I've been in Toronto, I've come to understand that not too bad can mean a whole bunch of things. And when we looked at, as Peter noted, this huge report called Toronto's Vital Signs Report, we looked at it this year, we weighed what was happening on the good side and on the not so good side, which we're going to go through. I looked at it and I said, you, the only way you can really characterize this is really not too bad. So I'm going to leave it to you to decide at the end of the day whether that not too bad is a good or that not too bad is not too bad. Now, we call it not too bad because there's some key themes that come out of this report. Because if you can imagine, there's a lot of information here. Um, I think you can sum it up by saying Toronto is sound, it's safe, but it's certainly struggling. And all of these are really important themes to weave together as to what the report's saying about Toronto. So in the first instance, it's sound. So when you look at a city that is number five in the world in terms of prosperity, number 12 in terms of competitiveness, and The Economist magazine ranks the city number four in the world for livability, I think the second or if not third year in a row. So we come right behind Melbourne, Vienna, Vancouver, and just ahead of Calgary in terms of livability. I mean, that's fairly remarkable. And if you think about it for a second, by the way, three of the top five cities in the world, according to The Economist, are Canadian cities. And I've said before that if this was sports, we'd have three players on the first all-star team on the planet. And that's something that you've got to recognize is, is a pretty good start. So in a, a number of respects, we're actually pretty sound. I can even drift off into some other areas and say, all right, we looked at innovation, we're doing pretty well. The environment, surprisingly, not that bad in terms of one smog day last year. That's the lowest in 11 years. When we start to look at things like uh, beaches, we've got beaches in Toronto, and they're actually pretty clean beaches. Eight of 11 are blue flag beaches. And if you know anything about blue flag beaches, they're among the cleanest in the world. It's pretty good. Our water consumption is down by about 20% since 2003, and that's on a per capita basis. So you've got these little indicia out there that say, holy moly, we're actually doing pretty well out there. Every year I'm asked, what's the single biggest thing that jumped out at me um, in terms of the report? And I think we had a certain amount of consensus at our foundation when we talked about it. And it's, it's going to kind of send you in a different direction for a second. Despite what you hear on the news, it's safety. We had another killing last night. There was a shooting at Jane and Finch. That's horrible. We're having a series of sexual assaults in the Board Christie area. This is terrible. And when it hits the news, it hits us very personally. But on a macro level, when you start looking at crime, in fact, we're down about 5.6% since last year. We're down 35% over five years. Last year's 49 homicides were the lowest in 11 years. The average in Toronto, in fact, is 63 homicides a year. That's not good. But if you look at a comparator city, and let's go south of the border for a minute, Chicago, for a whole bunch of different uh, reasons, very different, but also very similar in the sort of size of the city. They're having a good year. They're going to have 423 murders, homicides. So in a number of respects, we're actually doing pretty well on the safety side. So when we took a big step back and we looked at what's happening in Toronto, you couldn't deny that on the economic side, we're actually doing pretty well. From the outside looking in, we're doing darn well. Safety is starting to look really good. Then we looked at the other side. We said, well, listen, what's really going on in the city that we think we need to be addressing? And what started to jump out at us was clearly the struggling side. And I want to paint a little bit of a picture. It's going to take us out of this year and take us back into the period from 1970 to 2005. And David Olchansky from the University of Toronto created a wonderful report that looked at the city over this time period. It's all about city one, two, and three. Many of you would have read this, but I'm going to try and collapse that into a story and bring it into today and make a point out of it. So 1970 to 2005, unbelievable economic growth in the city of Toronto. We go from 1996 to about 2010. We've got a, we go from a GDP of about 80 billion to about 130 billion a year. Enormous growth. 1970, 2005. 1970, we've got two-thirds of all neighborhoods in the city of Toronto are middle-income neighborhoods. By the time you get to 2005, that two-thirds has now become 
Over the same time period, high and very high income neighborhoods went from 7% of all the neighborhoods and doubled to about 15% of all neighborhoods. And when you go down to the low or very low income neighborhoods over the same time period, they doubled as a percentage and went from about 20 to about 40% of all neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. So the question becomes at the end of the day, if we've had such tremendous economic growth during this time, what's happened to the middle class? What's given rise to this unbelievable inequality that we're now living in in Toronto? Because that picture, when we go beyond 2005 and takes us to today, we're looking at a city that's got 43% of our residents live in low or very low income neighborhoods. And if you do the math, that works out to 1 million people. 1 million people who are living in low or very low income neighborhoods, and I'll throw some more stats at you. Two thirds of them are visible minorities. I'm going to tell you 30% of all households right now in the city of Toronto live below the poverty line. And of that two thirds, half of them live on less than $13,500 a year, which many of you know equates to a lot of lease payments for your cars in Toronto. So when we start talking about this city that's always a top five city on the planet, the question becomes, Who's actually living in that number four city in the world? It depends on what side of the line you're actually on. So let me extrapolate a little bit more from this 43%. Some of the other numbers that are showing up will tell us that by 2025, which is not too far from now, 60% of all neighborhoods in the city of Toronto will be low or very low income. Just think about that. Fully beyond the tipping point, 60% of them. Now let's jump ahead to another magic year, which is 2031. And here's another moment where there's a big aha that comes out of this. 2031, there are going to be twice as many seniors than youth in the region. So not surprisingly, declining birth rate, aging population. We're going to have a real demographic uh, hit that we're going to take in 2031. The other one around the same time, this speaks to the amount of change that we're experiencing in Toronto. And that is, that in the city of Toronto, we're going to have roughly 80% of all people living in the city of Toronto will either be immigrant or children of immigrants. So if you think the last 25 years of the history of the city of Toronto was a whole lot of change, you ain't seen nothing yet. Things are going to pick up dramatically. So let me try and take a step back and start talking about what does this all mean and what can we do about it? Because I think you know, the way you want to look at this will really tell you a lot about what the potential solutions are. Because there are enormously uh, wonderful opportunities in this story as well. But we do need to take a step back. And we do need to look at the big picture and say, if this is the type of inequality that we've created in the city through extremely good times, what do we need to start thinking about to try to ameliorate this divide and start to do some positive things to make sure that we've got a bright future for the city of Toronto so we're way beyond not too bad and we can start becoming the city that we think is really great. And there are a couple things that I wanted to touch on. I think the first one is really infrastructure. And the big picture on infrastructure is there are really two sides of it. Uh, there's the physical infrastructure, not surprisingly, we've got uh, you know, roads and bridges, we've got water mains that are over 100 years old in this city. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking twice about driving under the gardener these days. Uh, transit, we're going to touch on a little later, big issue in the city of Toronto. So, Physical infrastructure is enormous. It's our circulatory system when you think about transit. We've got to do something about it. The other side we need to think about, too, though, is the social infrastructure of the city. So I really get concerned about those million people living in City 3 and how that's going to grow. And what do we start to, uh, doing in terms of affordable housing so we can actually have young people moving into the city as the region starts to double its... its uh, seniors than youth. I mean, that's a big demographic tipping point. So we need to start thinking around things such as youth unemployment, affordable housing, issues that we need to be looking at square on. One of the other pieces I think we need to be considering is uh, our governance. And this is a piece that usually gets people's eyes rolling back. I don't know if anybody's actually had an exciting chat about governance before, but I like to remind people that we live in a 21st century city but it's got an 1867 governance system wrapped around it. And you're seeing it play out in transit right now. And what I really mean by that is, I don't know if you know this, but 90 cents out of every tax dollar generated in the city of Toronto goes to the province and the federal government. So we are literally 
the engine driving at least the province of Ontario, if not Canada. And a lot of that wealth is actually sliding out of the city, and we're actually getting starved on the way back. So something along that line is having to give, and we're going to see that play out in the transit side. So the way I've posited this story so far, though, you kind of look at it and go, oh my goodness, I thought I lived in a great city. Well, in fact, we do, because I think we've got the bones of the architecture to do something really remarkable. And the Vital Signs Report as a report could really steer us in that direction. And I want to take a side jog for a minute and talk about the report itself. Now that you've heard all this story, you can say, well, what do you do about this? Well, there are millions of reports out there, but at our foundation, we use this report as the strategic guide for what we're going to do in all of our granting and city building. In other words, what we see in here is what tells us where to put our money and where to connect our donors into. By the same token, we put that report out and we share it with the public in the city to say, let's get on the same page at least once a year, and let's call that the vital science page, and use that as a foundation to talk about how do we build a better city. And this year I introduced a slightly different theme because when I looked at the report, I started to see very different things this year. And the theme that I really started to, or wanted to introduce is the notion of we used to define or still define success in Toronto as GDP, growth, prosperity, gross domestic product. I alluded to earlier, between 1996 and 2011, we went from about $83 billion to $130 billion a year in GDP in the city. And we want to pat ourselves on the back because that's a great number. It's over 50% growth. So we want to say we were really prosperous. And I say, that's fantastic. But boy, did we create a lot of inequality out of that. Maybe GDP is not the thing to be looking at. So what can we look at? How about happiness? So in 1972, Bhutan decided they're going to measure gross domestic happiness. And everybody said, well, good on you, Bhutan. Well, guess what? There have been a lot of people who've stepped up and said, Happiness is actually something we need to seriously consider. So Jeffrey Sachs now does a World Happiness Report for Index for the United Nations. Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard University, wrote his book on the politics of happiness. Basically said, hey guys, we've got thousands of reports about happiness. This is how you connect it with public policy and actually do something about it. Because at the end of the day, don't we all want to be happy? So what does that mean for the city of Toronto, though? Well. There's a great old saying uh, that Henry Thoreau has. It goes like this. What's important in life is not what you look at, but what you see. So when I see the report this year, although I see a city that's sound, safe, and struggling, I see the city that's got the architecture and the bones to really be a happy city. So when you bring that down, though, to earth, what does that really mean? And there are really three components of it, I believe, will really get us out of this. And the first is, that a happy city really is a city that moves, a city that works, and a city that lives. And let me deconstruct that a little bit. A city that moves. We talk, we're going to talk more about the transit part, I'm guessing, but that's absolutely key to making a happy city out here. And it's not just about getting goods and services and people around the city quickly. It's also about connecting marginalized community with the larger city. So when you start to think about transit city and other plans, the strategy underlining that was not just about getting cars off the road and getting people onto public transit. It was about connecting these very important but marginalized neighborhoods with the larger city. Then there's the notion of a city that moves can have another meaning. And that's a city that moves others, and that's other cities, by our leadership example. There are cities around the world that come to our doorstep to say, how do you do what you do? Things like diversity, things like our servility, our governance, our strong institutions. How did you invest in a city that could be a leadership model to other cities? And I think that that's an obligation that we have, and we have an opportunity to lead even more by continuing to invest in the type of civil society we have in Toronto. So we can move in the old-fashioned way of transit, but we can also move others to a greater place on their own. Then there's the notion of a city that works. And from time to time, I, I kind of question this when I hear what's coming out of City Hall, that, you know what, despite all this stuff, the city actually works. It functions. You know, we wouldn't be a fourth best city on the planet if we didn't function well. So we need to continue to reinforce our institutions 
and in our attitudes to make sure that the work actually continues. Then the other side of work is probably the more traditional side of it. And that is, you know, this city has been built by newcomers since 1793. There's ingenuity, there's hard work, there's collaboration, there's all sorts of good things going on, and we need to continue to reinforce that. It's a part of our DNA. I could sit here and speak all evening about the demographic importance of immigration to the future of this country. Those that actually look at this stuff will tell you that we need 100 million people in this country to really get us and keep us at this level of prosperity. But suffice it to say that we've got to do a heck of a better job of retaining the best of the brightest, attracting the best of the brightest, and actually integrating them into the, into the labor force so we can not only build prosperity, but stronger Canadian citizens. I mean, that's the whole part of nation building. So that's the work part that I think about. And then I think about the lives part. City that lives. It's got to start with sustainability. You've got to build a city that's sustainable. And when I think about some of the statistics that I'm looking at in the report, I'm reminded that we've got 20,000 green jobs that have been developed in the region um, over the last while. We've got a good majority of the TDSBs close to 600 schools and now eco-schools. So you know, we talked about the smog days, we can talk about clean beaches. There are a number of things that we're actually doing on the environmental side that says, guess what, we're kind of getting it, but we can't let our foot off the pedal. These are very important things. Let's keep it moving. Then the other side of lives that really appeal to me is, you know, quite frankly, a city that knows how to live, you know, is a city that knows how to live it up. And I think we dump on ourselves a little bit in Toronto, but you can't deny we've got probably the best film festival on the planet. We have things like Louis Blanche. You know, when I think about our food, our restaurants, our museums, our galleries, you know, you know, the film industry that's burgeoning here. You know, caravan, all of those things that make this such a great place. You know, this is a city that knows how to live it up. And we need to continue to think about supporting that and investing in it and reminding ourselves that guess what? You know, arts and culture, it makes us happy. It's a good thing. We don't have to just look at the GDP and the money it puts into our economy. It's actually okay to look at doing things and say we're doing it because it makes us happy. So when I unwind all of this and take it back into the vital signs report, you know, it's a really an interesting place to look at the city and say, all right, we know what we're looking at, but what do we really see? And it's a lot of opportunity. It's an opportunity to obviously transform conditions so we can deal with some of our issues on the ground from affordable housing to transit to newcomer integration to youth to all of those issues we would traditionally look at. But if you want to see it a different way, that's just a platform to really build a happy city. And I think we've really got the tools and the attributes to do that. We've got the capacity to do it. The big thing that has to shift in the city is we've got to shift our attitude. And the attitude is really shifting towards, first, let's start celebrating our successes. Secondly, let's really start to work in terms of collaboration. And the third piece is, frankly, we just got to believe we've got the bones to do it and we can do it. So I'm going to leave my comments on that on Vital Signs. I wanted to take you through some of what I thought were the high points. And I hope I left you in a place that could be moderately happy or a place to start to build that. All right. Thanks very much, Earl. It was a, a great, swift digest of a lot of numbers. And we will pull those uh, theaters in New York and uh, some recent experiences you've had. Thank you. Has he not got the perfect job? You are the perfect head of the Toronto Community Foundation. What a wonderful, passionate thing you just did for your city. And as a, as a, you told me I, I always will be a Torontonian. Yeah. Uh, as a, as a uh, uh, Torontonian and an exile living in the RC. Uh, it's just wonderful to see your leadership. So really, I'm hats off to you. I'm so thank, you. thanks for inviting me, and nice to be with you, Peter. Again, uh, I've been in the United States for a number of years now, and a number of my friends have come tonight, so thank you very much, my Toronto friends, who wonder what I really do for a living. They've shown up to see if they will make them. Do you hear them laugh? That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> because they want to hear what I'm about. So I, I just want to uh, just say, first off, that Rahul came last year to talk in New York City. The organization that I um, work with uh, has an annual summit on the future of New York, and it's next week, week from tonight, and today and tomorrow. And uh, Rahul came and sat on a panel to talk about livability which is the key thing that we're concerned about in, in our organization. And we were a terrific ambassador for Toronto. And, but I also got to say that 
uh, only in Toronto could you give a talk and say that we're aspiring to be happy. If I stood up in New York, have you been to New York? <laughs> if I stood up in New York and said, let's be happy, honestly, I'd be drummed up in the room, but it's just not, a, not necessarily the attribute that they would highlight. Um, but I think it's sort of consistent with the Canadian personality that we want to be happy and friendly and all those things. So I'm, I'm happy to be back here if they will be friendly. So uh, let me just, what I'm going to do, uh, hopefully, if I have the right buttons, what do you think I'm going to do? Side of the circle. All right, I'm so glad you know what you're doing. There. So um, what Rahul didn't know when he asked me to come do this is I don't think he knew that I was actually involved in the early genesis of uh, vital science, which was in the late 90s. And I can tell you that the, two, the way that vital science was, was originally envisioned is before you were just a boy, uh, when it was first being conceived, it was two other foundations. It was the Laidlaw Foundation, and Nathan Gilbert is here somewhere, the director of it, and, uh, and Alan Broadbent, who's uh, the head of the Matrix Foundation. And I worked, as Peter explained, I ran something called Ideas That Matter with Alan, which was interested in cities. And out of that came this notion, Nathan was familiar with other initiatives that were going on around the country, in North America, where communities were using a set of indicators to galvanize a kind of collective political will around things that need to change. And, uh, and out of that came vital science. And I put the, the verb here in front of it, taking Toronto's vital science, because the reason that name was conceived, and now vital science, is, as you probably know, is proliferated into cities around uh, Canada and to a certain extent in the United States. The reason we took that was this notion that you would annually take stock of what was going right in the city and what was not, and what needed fixing. And I can tell by looking at what started as uh, 15 or 18 people in a room banging heads trying to decide, well, do we want to measure housing or do we want to measure crime, to now a 200 plus page report. That one of the great challenges with these exercises is to try to decide what do you want to measure and how do you use these measurements as a kind of catalyst for the kinds of positive change that you think the city needs to be addressing. And, you, and this is what I think that Rebel and I will talk about afterwards. Because I think it's a great, great difficulty with these exercises when you start to measure too many things and people just get overwhelmed with all the choices. So at, at the Municipal Arts Society, the organization that I work with, we do an annual survey and we made the decision to not do the vital science choice. The, the vital science databases are based on objective data. There are organizations that actually tally the information. These guys aggregate it and make a really clear picture for you so you can delve in there and have a good look to see. We decided to do it a little differently in, in um, New York. And so we actually poll, we use a polling company, and we survey New Yorkers. And we ask them subjectively what their experience is of living in the city. And then we use that as an informer for us as to what we think needs to be tweaked. So it's a different way of getting at it. When we were early doing early vital signs in the late 90s, we thought, no, we can't use subjective data because if people are in a bad mood in East York, you know, that's going to skew the data. Sorry, East York people. I'm old enough to remember there was an East York. And, uh, uh, but, so we made a different decision here in Toronto, but in New York, this is what we've done. Now, this information, this is a fancy word, it's all embargoed, right? So please don't go and talk to the Toronto Star, who is in here. And I know that Young Street Media will, will respect this. We're not releasing this until next week, and I'm going to go through it so quickly you won't remember it. But um, it will give you the general gist of what we're measuring. So this is where I live. This is what New York City looks like, and this is a view from Brooklyn. And that's one of the things that's interesting between Toronto and New York. I, I said to these guys when we were doing the prep call, one of the interesting things about working in New York City and commuting, thanks to Porter, into Toronto periodically, honestly, I could shut my eyes, attend a meeting here with you tonight, go into the meeting I'm going to go into in tomorrow morning in Manhattan, and the issues are very similar. Different in scale, different kinds of political traditions, but very similar issues. And so when you stand here in Brooklyn and you look into Manhattan, you already can tell that the built form varies, that the incomes vary, that the populations vary, that there's lots of tension between what's going on downtown and what's going on in the suburbs, and all the kinds of things that Toronto is wrestling with, New York is wrestling with too. Um, so I'm just going to run through these really quickly and you can't see them, so it's almost perfect for me. Um, this is a question about satisfaction. This is the way that we get at livability. Are you satisfied with living here or not at all satisfied? And we've got 84% of New Yorkers are satisfied with living in New York. That to me is extraordinary. I, bet, I don't think they were happy, but they are, they are content with living in the city. And then if we ask them about their neighborhood, same number. A few more are just satisfied, not very satisfied with their neighborhood. Very small difference, but still, 85% of New Yorkers are happy. I don't know if they're happy. I'll take it back. They're satisfied to be living in the city. Here we ask, though, a very specific question, which is what I think Toronto needs to think a little bit about. 
If you want to find out why people are happy, this is the way we get it. We say, which of the following is the biggest threat to you continuing to be happy, to live happily in New York? And what's interesting is it's equally, pretty equally distributed between employment opportunities, public safety, housing, and uh, the cost of how expensive it is. And when we disaggregate that down into the boroughs, the priorities change somewhat. So in Manhattan, what do you think it is? Housing. Housing, exactly. And if you're in the Bronx, what do you think it is? Crime. Crime. You guys are good. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and interestingly, in Brooklyn, we're seeing those numbers shift because housing is getting more expensive in Brooklyn now. So more people are saying that. But again, you can see there's a distribution, and what motivates people and what, what they comment on does vary somewhat depending on the particular part of the city. I suspect if we did the same thing, and we asked people in the Toco, or Scarborough, or uh, um, North York, um, and the city, the old city of Toronto, the answer would be slightly different as well. Um, then we ask them these things. We've got all this data disaggregated by borough and by income and by race and by gender. Um, if we said, what's most important to you to have in your neighborhood? This is, can be quite striking. I'd be interested to know whether Toronto would respond this way. What's most important? Open spaces and parks. Then more housing, then more retail, and then better transportation services. And then similarly, but this is, now this is a question that I bet you would get a different answer in, in, in Toronto. When you ask, yes, exactly. When you ask New Yorkers, aggregated across the whole population, do you have good access to transportation? Look at that number, 94% feel they have good access to transportation. That would not fly here in Toronto, I know it. Uh, and that's interesting, that has to do, with now it's old infrastructure, but it exists. And that has to do with an extensive subway and bus and, and increasingly uh, uh, light rail that's accessible. Um, I just do this thing because I think you'd be interested because I know Toronto loves their library and loves, and loves bragging about your circulation rates and I talk about it in, in New York about how we get the highest circulation rate per capita here in Toronto. Um, interestingly, when they ask what's the quality of your libraries, again, you see this skew. So in Manhattan, high quality, to a certain extent Queens, and then it drops off. But it's still a pretty high number uh, in terms of what percentage of people think that the library service is really good. But when you actually ask them if they're going to the library, <laughs> now this to me is one of the concerns about data, and we'll have a conversation about it. So they may say the libraries are great, but look at that, all, over half the population aren't going to the library at all. They're not stepping in the door, and then a slightly higher percentage are starting to go once or twice. And then you see a chunk of people, obviously who have kids in the programs, and they're going often. But to me, these are the kinds of ways that you have to nuance these indicators to be able to find out what it's really telling you. So if you just step back, and said, well, they think they have a great library, but when you actually find out they're not using it. Similarly, if you do the same thing in terms of cultural opportunities, MAS is concerned about livability. We talk about culture just like you did, and we see livability as being an underpinning to the quality of life, and we use that in terms of access to arts and culture. Again, ask people, tell me the rating of these, of these uh, amenities in your community, in your neighborhood. Of course, Manhattan scores highly, but the other ones, not, not quite as highly. But again, if you go and you say, well, how many of you are going? Look. 63% didn't go anywhere last year. <laughs> what were they doing? I guess they're sitting at home watching television. But, but you know, to me, that's, that's to me the more disturbing and the more meaningful statistic. That tells me that there's something around access. And it, interestingly, um, I don't think I showed here, but when you actually drill down and ask them why aren't they going, cost is like fourth on the list. It's not cost. So when we and when we're defining cultural opportunity, we're talking about things like do you go to the global art gallery? Do you go to something nearby? Do you do, we're really being really general here. It's not about gee, do you go to the Broadway? It's much more general, and it's not cost that's discouraging them. So here, when I ask them, you see, 46% are saying it's not conveniently located, and then 21% say it doesn't exist in my neighborhood. That's an interesting issue for us in terms of distribution, as it would be here. A certain 14%, the Neanderthal group, the performances aren't interesting. They're not doing Kiss Me Kate, so I'm not going to go. Uh, and then 7% say it's too expensive. But see, I, we all thought it would be cost, didn't you? I'm sure you thought they were going to say it's too expensive. Um, similarly here, this, I'm putting this up for Dave Harvey, and he emailed me just before he came to say he's not coming. So could all of you that know Dave Harvey tell him that I put a slide up for him? Um, this is all about New Yorkers' appreciation of parks. To me, it's pretty interesting how high these numbers are. 80% uh, say that the parks are excellent in Manhattan, but you can see it's a pretty fair number now and it's growing over time. We track these data so we can see the trends. But what's interesting to me is when I click to the next one, look at that. Lots of people are going to parks. So we have to think to ourselves, some are, doing it, some are going a lot, 
Some of the people are going often and even more often, but you can see how distributed. It's not 90% or 80% aren't going to parks at all. So to me, if you're in the livability business, we have to think to ourselves, well, why is it that parks are getting the kind of action and the kind of take? I'm not sure that's true when you and I are a kid. I'm trying to think whether or not parks were as valued 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, when I was <laughs> Just tell us a bit about the source of this data, too, because one of the big differences is that yours is more of a compendium this is original survey research? This is all done by Marist Public Opinion Research. Right. So it's it's a survey of 2,000 New Yorkers done in September using, and we've had to change that. It used to be landlines only, now it's landlines and cell phones, and it's distributed by income and by borough, and it's, I don't know, it's, re, you know, it's accurate to whatever pollster we'll uh, percentage. Yeah. Uh, and we're about to launch one online because we want to see whether or not we get similar online. Uh, this is the, the last couple of slides I have around these, and I, I really handpicked these because I think they would resonate for you here in Toronto. So interestingly, when we ask New Yorkers, how important is it that you, you have a world-class ground transportation hub, subways, trains, stuff like that, right? Look at that. Like we have a very large consensus. 88% of the population understand the importance of public transportation. It's not really, it does not have to be sold in, Toronto, in, in New York City at all, in any of the boroughs. Everybody gets this. I was on the ferry coming across Porter two or three trips ago, and I got into this big, huge conversation with this person who completely told me that any kind of investment in public, uh, public transit in Toronto was a waste of money. She was standing on the ferry going across. <laughs> <laughs> um, similarly, look at the other consensus we have in New York. I wonder if you had it here. What is that? 60, that's 9% of the population understand that it's totally critical that we have high quality universities and colleges. These are to me interesting sort of bellwethers of where the consensus in the city is. So the last slide I just want to show you here, it's not the best slide because I took it myself, that's all you need to know, I took it myself, um, for my cell phone. A couple of months ago I was in Providence, Rhode Island. So if you remember anything I want you to Google water fire in Providence, Rhode Island. Providence, Rhode Island had, like many cities, it had uh, streams running through it. And a number of decades ago, it covered them and piped them, which is what our beloved engineering call it. Any, any engineers in the house? They, they're afraid to come out. <laughs> and our beloved engineering colleagues used to take these things and they'd say, well, we don't want water running through a city. Let's cover it up. And so they piped them over and then they built roads. And some communities have gotten smart and they do this wonderful thing called daylighting. And that's what happened in Providence. They daylit there's their water courses. And so now, running through Providence is this wonderful set of streams and rivers that go through, and then they have bridges over them. And a smart artist 18 years ago said, how can we use this water, these water courses as a way to animate public space and bring people into downtown and have something fabulous happen? And he created Water Fire, and it's been growing and growing for 17 or 18 years. So here's what happens on Saturdays, almost every other Saturday in the summer in Providence. They have 80 of these cribs that have wood in them. Called, they call them Brad, uh, see, I can't even say it. I, I kept wanting to call them braziers, and I realized that wasn't quite the term. I had to keep thinking Dairy Queen. They brash, br uh, br braziers, thank you, braziers. See, I'm part Braziers, and they put 80 braziers in the, they set them in the river, and then they put wood in them. And at seven o'clock in the evening, they put uh, a number of gondolas out on these route on the on the water, and eight people, all the time, they have 250 volunteers that do this, and eight people in a boat, and all dressed in black, and I was asked to come and be a volunteer lighter. So I had to wear black, I get in the boat, the gondola goes out at seven o'clock, and from seven o'clock in the evening until midnight, they pipe in extraordinary music that that artist, same guy, curates, modern, contemporary, classical, choral, blasting through the downtown province. And you go and you light these things. So I have to light 25 of them. And then those volunteers in the boat, I get out, and those volunteers in the boat replenish that every 20 minutes as they burn down. And they have this extraordinary event that goes on every second Saturday in the summer. And they have memorials attached to it, and people come from all over the place, and pot and candy, lots of good stuff. And it's really extraordinary. But this time that I went, they added an extra feature, which is this. They invited a hundred paddlers, canoeists, kayakers, paddle boat people, to create this kind of fish ornamentation, and then they lit them. And so you can see that there are boat people underneath these, and they invited those hundred paddlers to start at the ocean, 
two hours before, and paddle in. And they paddled in and arrived at 7 o'clock, and then Karoos went through the rest, to signify the return of aquatic life to downtown urban watercourses. It was extremely moving. And these folks, there were little kids, there were older folks with their fish. And it reminded me, where is Nathan? It reminded me that when we started Vital Signs, we had Lee Hatcher come from Sustainable Seattle, which was the first community leader project. And he came and he talked about what had transformed Seattle through that project was that their goal, their lead aspiration, was to bring wild salmon back into the rivers in Seattle. And when I saw this, I was taken right back to hearing Lee Hatcher talk about that. And I would throw that out as the challenge, I think, for Toronto. Now that you've got 12 years of vital science, or 11 years of vital science, and you've got all those positive things that the city is doing so well, which I totally agree. Whenever my friends complain to me about Toronto, I say, yeah, go and live somewhere else. Well, come back and you'll love Toronto. Toronto has so much going for it. I really don't like going right. <laughs> um, There's so much going for it. But I think that the great challenge that I see now as an outsider, uh, looking back, is how can you galvanize and decide what are the couple of key things that Toronto needs to focus on? And I think that's, what, what's your wild salmon proxy? And when Nathan and Alan were first banging heads about this project, they kept trying to come, out, come up with, and with your predecessor, uh, Carol Oliver, they kept trying to come up with what are the key bellwether signs that would motivate Torontonians to say, yes, what's aspirational, that's what we need to work towards, we want to bring salmon back, or whatever it is. And, and what do you think that would be that would really get people's attention and motivate them to become engaged in the city and be involved? Because, again, one of the things that you see, with all the good signs that you've indicated, one of the great things you see as a challenge in Toronto is that you don't really have a strong political collective will happening. And that's very obvious to me, reading on my Kindle every morning, the newspapers from Toronto. <laughs> uh, and I think that it's up to people like you to try to figure that out and figure out what can you come up with that could galvanize that across the, the old cities and that are now the not going to Toronto and figure out what that should be. Terrific. Thank you, Mary. very quickly to the room and invite you up or pass around a microphone so you can ask your questions as well. I, I think the question for you both though, and in fact I'm going to rely a little bit on, on uh, your knowledge as a sort of historian of, of civic life and of cities here, Mary. I think I'm so sorry my father's dead that he didn't hear you describing as a historian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think to live in the city and certainly to be an observer of it is to know that it really feels like there's a a shift underway. One of the numbers that's touted in the media that you mentioned in the report is the number of high rises going. 189 high rise starts in Toronto. Next closest city in North America, Mexico City, 88 starts. New York City, 82. Uh, so the fabric of the city is changing dramatically. Meanwhile, we've got David Holchansky saying, hang on, whoa, the 1970s middle-class Toronto that is still very much a core part of the city's identity is under immense stress and you're telling us that by 2030 it's going to be uh, a pipe dream. So I want to talk about how happiness can get us there, but I also want to talk about just this phase change that it feels like the city is going through and, and is, it, is it kind of an inevitable sorting out that's happening? Mary, why don't we start with well, I, I was interested when I saw the executive summary that that, that number of building uh, starts was seen as a positive. Because I've got to say again, as some of you have episodically, to just come in on the gardener and see all those condos going up, it's really quite breathtaking. You probably don't notice it because you live in it, but for me, to see all those developments and then wonder, is the investment in the public ground around it being done in, in concert with it? We have these issues in New York City, where we have parts of the city where, the, where density is increasing, and where obviously you have to take population somewhere. And I'm a density fan, believe me, I want to see tall buildings and dense buildings, but I want to see them in particular kinds of contexts. And also where you've got public amenities to support them. And I'd be interested to know whether the foundation is tackling that to really challenge the development industry and the city to be thinking about all the planning that needs to go around those intensified developments. What's the public space look like? Where are the schools going? Where's the retail going? Retail in many ways is more important than public space for lots of folks. Certainly lower income folks want a place to go shop. And I, I, I'm going to throw it back to you. T to me, to just willy-nilly be throwing stuff up 
without really having all sorts of other incentivized uh, programs and initiatives to build up around them. You give that a green dot, these high rise. Yeah. Is it a green dot or is it something else? Uh, it can be a green dot. It has the potential of being a green dot uh, to the extent that we are bringing it in for intensification and, and, and to build up the density in areas. Now, does it have the possibility of going the other direction? Uh, absolutely. There's an, uh, you know, remember last year's report, when we looked at uh, the spending of each tax dollar, it was roughly 50 cents of every tax dollar would go to EMS, and it was under 2 cents that was actually going to city planning. So the right. whole concept of city planning has really taken a back seat in the city. <coughs> now, what's happened as a result of that? You know, I remember the discussion 10 years ago, uh-oh, let's not block the waterfront. Well, that one's lost. Yep. Right? It's done. They're up there now. The, when you look at the, the condos that are being built, particularly along the waterfront or along the Gardner, these are not family condos. These are not intended for families for the most part. And the big the, you know, battle with the development group right now is to say, you know, provide or create a business model that permits multi uh, units or family units so you can actually start to have families coming downtown. And so when you start to think about the issue of low income families, they're not moving downtown because no families are moving downtown right now. So we're creating a very different cohort in terms of high rises down there. So it, it's, it's a sweet and sour. It has the potential to be something really remarkable because you don't want a ton of people um, outside the city trying to get back in because it's just creating additional problems with congestion. Mm -hmm. So you end up with these bizarre concentric circles and you're never actually figuring out a very particular point. And when you get to, you know, Adam Vaughn makes a great case of the type of stuff that's going on in this community, saying, look, Section 37, uh, 37 money's out there, developers, make sure that it's committed to public space. Work on a system. And this is where the city used to play a much bigger role on creating parameters for developers to make two and three bedroom units. When they deregulated that whole space, the development community, and I've got very good friends who are developers who are saying to me, look, you know, the handcuffs are off, you know, they're just, we can't make money doing that way. But if we all had to do it a certain way, at least we'd all be playing by the same rules. So it's a green dot because it does speak to there's job creation. There's obviously uh, movement in the job market, so it's good. So the potential there is to do really well. The downside is that if we don't claim the public ground back and don't remember why we're building that, we could end up in a, in a pretty ugly situation. I mean, you know, I, I know my friends in the uh, audience will talk about this, but of course my view on this would be to, that we can't keep relying on Section 37. I'd rather be seeing a sum kind of commitment for municipal income tax. My friends in the province and the federal government are shaking their heads. I'd like to see, Don, where are you? You're on my side, I know, that we start to accumulate resources for the city to be able to spend money and invest in the public realm. And that that not be held, he wants to comment, that that not be held to the whims of developers who decide it's a good idea. Because they'll, you know, it gets, it becomes a kind of political football where the council decides, does the deal, figures out what he or she wants to do, and it's not as equitable if it were actually being administered by the city. So let's think, look, look, look to my um, beloved jurisdiction where I live now, there is a benefit to actually accumulating money held by the city government who then invest in that public realm, and that that be done intentionally and in a really planned way. I totally agree with you on the planning piece, the planning departments are being vetted. The truth of it, that's happening in cities everywhere, and so I think it becomes incumbent upon us as community members to be much more engaged because community-based planning is the way of the future that is happening in the Southern Hemisphere, that is happening in American cities. We can't rely on city governments to look out for your interests. So we all need to be much more engaged. And there are examples. We have one, we have a perfect one in Toronto, Regent Park, that has been developed with tons of community input. And it's a mix of densities, lots of high rise, but lots of low rise too, and a really significant investment in public infrastructure and space. I think Regent Park's can prove to be a, a really, and of course, you're here, one of the great, great early advocates that worked with the Regent Park Neighborhood Initiative. Um, so you're here. Uh, you know, there were lots and lots of people that put a lot of sweat and tears into that, and I bet you're going to find that that's a model that's meant to replicate everyone. We have to talk a little bit about transit here. We know that the city's just committed to public consultations about this. Metro Links is, has its big move. Uh, most people uh, may be aware here. 25 years, it's $50 billion. You've got to find $2 billion a year of new money to build and run the thing. Where do we start? 
So let me take my Metro Lynx hat off. Say, no, you're yeah. right. <laughs> Sorry about it, you're on the board. Firmly stick my TCF hat on. Um, the two sides of it, I'll, I'll talk about sort of the big move division part, and then I'll talk about the financing part for a minute. Um, a lot of the discussion around this has been uh, relieving congestion in the, uh, in the region, keeping up with the expanding uh, population. In other words, if we don't do something about it, we're in big trouble. And even what we're going to do about it is going to take a long time, and it's not going to be immediately alleviating everything um, on the spot. But when you start to think about the investment here, as I said a little bit earlier, it's not just about relieving congestion on the streets, it's also about connecting communities um, with the broader network, with the city, and other communities with other cities. So it's, it's about making sure that we're all connected, which is going to have some really long-term positive implications. The other part that I might remind people, let's turn to the money for a quick second, $50 billion is a lot of money here. And my own feeling is that if $50 billion only gets us some more LRTs and potentially subways and trains, you know, we're not thinking big enough. You know, $50 billion investment in regional public transit means everything from governance to design, construction, um, small business to support it, to the financing models. So we're going from soup to nuts on recreating transit, public transit. We could recreate this region that was built on private transit, which is really the auto industry, and recreate it and kickstart our, our economy based on public transit. I mean, we're going from soup to nuts. We can actually learn, capture this knowledge, and actually use it to really kickstart our economy. So I think there's a wonderful opportunity there. One of the challenges we're facing right now is the communication of all of this in the big move. It's, it's a big number. It's a complicated uh, story in a city that's what fourth largest media market in North America, try to get the story out there that people are going to comprehend. I think the consultation process is an, you know, it's an excellent opportunity to start to get to people to understand what their choices are. Uh, the troubling notion for me is when they did a poll, I think we did a poll about 18 months ago, that said over half the people in the city of Toronto believe that there's enough money in the system to already pay for the level of transit that we need to actually build out the big move. And unfortunately, that, in my opinion, is dead wrong. The last little piece I'll say about this is, we are the only OECD nation that does not have a federally funded transit plan. Mary, any thoughts I, on how I, to do transit I think we've got to be fun. We've got to get more fun about it. Right. It's too earnest. Sorry. Yeah. It's just too earnest. But let, let's remember, too, it, it may be fun and certainly essential, but it's also 300 bucks per person per year in the city yeah. and new revenues that have to be found. Well, I mean, I mean, so let me just say that I think that there are approaches. Let me tell you where I think you can, do, you can make it more fun. You could put more emphasis on design. Mm -hmm. Some of the most extraordinary transportation infrastructure that's being built in the world is being built by architects that are creating magnificent public spaces. And that's what people see. They see the building, they see the archways, they see the dramatic, they see the public space, they see a park. They see some fabulous water feature. They see the fact that it's combined with retail. They see that there's a movie, an outdoor movie theater that somebody's put there. They see eccentric, idiosyncratic things that, oh, oh, and did you know it's a bus terminal? Oh, and did you know it's also a tram line? This is where I think we need to get very imaginative. You have fabulous designers in Toronto. You have blocks and blocks of people, architects, ur uh, urban designers, graphic designers. There's a whole web of them down there around Spadina and Richmond in that area. They are designing these systems for every city except yours. And I really think that we need to get more fun. I, I've got to tell you, and you know, some of my best friends work at Metrolinx, uh, you're way too finger-wagging and earnest about this. I think you've got to get much more upbeat, fun, imaginative. It's a bit like convincing me to eat my vitamins by giving me something that's more tasty. How's that for another very uh, so now what I got to say is here's the quintessential difference between Americans and Canadians. Have I been right? American? Oh, this is wonderful. Well, this is great. Really been there. This is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you just heard the peace order and good government lecture on that's right. regional transit. No, that's right. Exactly. Thanks. Exactly. It's in our DNA. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. But I also think that that doesn't mean that, that we have to be, that we all be peace order and good government girl. It does not mean we have to be boring and earnest and, and lectury. And I think, that with all due respect to our previous mayor, I think that's part of what happened. I think that it became this kind of downtowners wagging their fingers at suburbanites and 905ers, and even the fact that they call them, that they call each other 905ers, and say, oh, you have to buy this bitter pill, you're going to have to start getting on a bus. 
room, and people just need to be moved into this. It's all going to happen, like whether we like it or not, people are going to be in transit. 30, 40 years from now, our children and grandchildren will be saying, oh, you used to own a car? Like, it's all going to happen, like it or not. But for the folks right now who see this as somehow infringing upon their autonomy, we've got to find another way. So let's start making fabulous, fabulous, smart, cute, groovy ways to make it cool to use alternate modes of transportation. Happy, happy transit, bro. Happy transit. Happy transit. <laughs> There's your campaign. Cool transit. On the subject of happiness, my last question. You said that TCF uses the vital science document to help you decide where to make investments in the city. The lens you're applying is we want a happier city. How will this year's report shape the investments you make in the coming year? So great question. So this will play itself out in a number of ways. Um, in the first instance, um, organizations that will apply to us for grants uh, will have to establish that they're actually moving the dial on vital science. And that's the first thing. So we'll evaluate those and see that those, those that are the best amongst those will likely get our grants. And remember, we provided a framework of happiness that's not hairy fairy. It's around moving, it's around livability and all the aspects, and around work and creating all of those binaries and supporting them. So I think it's actually pretty wide. We've got quite a bit of space in there. I might add that some of the other things that we're doing, you know, beyond that funding and connecting our donors with those organizations, is, you know, we're working on, uh, on our plan for keeps. So we've got a wonderful legacy project uh, that we've been working on that was a key legacy of the Ontario Summer Games. And it's about play. It's about community building, about building better, connected, stronger communities, by getting people out to know each other and to play. And to do that, you're going to be end up with healthier communities. We're going to be tackling the obesity issue. We're going to be tackling the newcomer integration issue. We're going to be about pulling people and communities together, creating networks around them. And of course, what's the core part of play? Fun. So the neighborhood games that have been launched now, and you're going to see much of this throughout the, the next year or so, keep your eyes open for playing for keeps, neighborhood games. You'll see that's all about bringing fun and play to the city. And I think that's a key component of livability and happiness. I, I don't want to get killed joy because I mean, you know, I don't want to say I'm against happiness, but I just you don't uh, want to say far away from me. But what I would say is that I'm a little concerned that it will get trivialized, and I think that the difficulty that I have had with these projects all along, which I can even have in New York, is that you know cities are not actually ours. You know, we're stewards. We're stewards of the most dynamic, creative human settlement that's ever existed. And it provides livelihoods for me and for you and for your children and for my children and for our grandchildren. And we are stewards of that. And so I think it's not just about my happiness. I think it's about the capacity of the city to be the most dynamic, resilient, livable place for future generations. So I don't want to be satisfied. To me, it's a little too self-satisfied to say, are we happy? The other side of it is, there's so many gazillions of reasons why people aren't happy. DNA, married the wrong person, you know, whatever the hell it is. You know, bad, bad meds. The city can't maybe fix it. And I don't want to be engaged in that. That's why I want to be about that, the, you know, cities are about creating conditions that enable you and I to make our own lot. And I, and that's the great challenge in every city. We've got people that, where the city's not enabling it well enough for them. So that's why I, I understand you want to hook, and I appreciate the need for that. But I would rather it not be something quite as tied to my own narcissistic needs and something a bit bigger. So this is when things get fun. We're actually going to have an argument over happiness now. <laughs> so this is when things get interesting. Uh, so, you know, Mary raised a really say, important point. You know, when, to stand up at our vital science talk and introduce the notion of happiness, I was also very concerned about, geez, that's a pretty hairy-fairy idea. Let's not trivialize it. The point that I'm really trying to make is obviously we all want to be happy. And there's no reason the city shouldn't want us to be happy either. And of course, there are a host of reasons why individuals might not, but there is a collective happiness that we can approach by doing some very real things. And the key to this, though, is that if we create a city that moves, a city that works, and a city that lives, we will create the environment for that prosperity that everybody is looking for as well. So what I'm really doing is say, how do we look at success slightly differently? So if they're miserable, it's their own fault. Then. <laughs> well, we're going to create a city that you can't be miserable. You can't be miserable. Right. <laughs> but, and you still come from, I love New York. I know. So there, there's some affection there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why don't we turn to our very... It's too much like that it's not...
I mean, I'm the one who's saying I want Section 37 money to be formalized and put in the government's coffers. But I also understand what you're suggesting. The great thing about Bryant Park is it's used by everybody. So the people that stare at it contribute to it. But it's every kind of person there. I don't know if you've been to Bryant Park, you need to go. You can, you can borrow a book, you can read a magazine, you can play a game of chess, you can play, you can um, just lie around in the suntan, you can have a beer, you can have a cup of coffee, you can loaf. And everybody does everything there, and or you can just hightail it through on your way to, to the library. It's right behind the public library, and I, I totally agree with you that the, one of the advantages to building smaller units, with your, I understand that it's disadvantaging people with children, but in New York City, the reason that you, Bryant Park is valued is because you don't hang out in your condominium. You may own it, but it's the size of this table. It's tiny, so you don't spend a lot of time there. You're outside. You're in public space. And I think that maybe we're going to see that evolution happen in Toronto, where people will start to spend more time on some. Uh, out of Paris, basically, out of France, and, uh, 10 years ago, all the riots were taking place in the, in the Parisian suburbs of Marseille. And you guys know the story, but the notion was somebody standing up and saying, how come we've got all these immigrant youth and they're burning up our, uh, our suburbs? Aren't we treating them well? And somebody says, we've got a much bigger problem. They're not immigrant youth. In fact, they're third generation Parisians or French kids. They just have different color skin. And they've come from somewhere else, so at least their grandparents did. So they've hit a glass ceiling here. They've got a diminished sense of belonging. They do not have the same sense of being French as the rest of us do. They don't have the same stake in the system. And we've seen that playing out in other cities like London, we saw the riots in the summer and the sort. Well, with the amount of diversity that we have in the city of Toronto, you know, I've got lots of people asking me, are we at risk for ending up like Paris did? And to be honest with you, you know, I think we've got a different context here. We're, we're a different type of DNA in the city. But we'd be naive to think that we can continue down this path and not expect some sort of turmoil along the way. So along there, we start saying, well, what's going on with the sense of belonging in the city of Toronto? And when you start looking at the numbers, they're actually not too bad. So you've got about two-thirds of the people in the city of Toronto that have a decent sense of belonging. So if, to that, you know, if you want to use that as a little bit of a proxy for happiness, that's actually not too bad at all, until you peel back. And look at social mobility. And then you start to peel back and you start to say, well, who are the happy ones? Even when you start looking at uh, first generation, the first generation adults are pretty comfortable saying, guess what? I know that I'm not the engineer that I could be back in Egypt, but I'm over here, I'm, I'm making a living, my kids are going to have a better future. So it's all on the next generation. Now, go find out what those kids feel about what their prospects are. Ah, now you got a dip. Now you've got an issue. So there's some things that are out there that we're tracking and looking at that I think that are linked to happiness. They're very real and they're happening in our city. But by thinking about success differently and thinking about creating a city that moves, lives, and works actually helps us to start to deal with some of those inequalities, move the dial on the sense of belonging, hopefully in the right populations, and actually increase the overall happiness and to mitigate some of those potential risks that some other large cities are having. You know, uh, just hearing you talk, I mean, I, I, John, I appreciate the, the legitimacy of your question, and I hope giving you a really serious, thoughtful answer, and I'm going to give you what I hope isn't too, too silly an answer back, but I, I want us to think about other kinds of measures completely. So, for instance, I'd like a measure on cognitive surplus. Who knows what cognitive surplus is? Tell us what it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So it means that things that, like this gentleman just answered, I bet you have cognitive surplus time. That's probably why you're here with us tonight. He has, he does in his day job a bunch of things that I don't know how to do. And he's got the capacity to solve a problem that I'm dealing with probably in 10 minutes that would take me like three days. And so the notion of cognitive surplus is that there's so much quick learning going on that if we had vehicles for us to share our learnings, we'd be able to help each other out in all sorts of ways. And it probably, he would probably do it for me, even though he doesn't even know me, he might do it for me for free. And we have all sorts of problem solving that's being enabled by technology based on cognitive surplus. We all have some of it. It might be that you know how to cook something or you know how to fix something or a lot of apps that are being developed are being developed by people at three in the morning who have bandwidth and time to do it. So can we come up with a measure on cognitive surplus? Because I think we've got tons of it. People who have energy. That's what the whole social innovation movement is about. It tends to be dominated by young people in their 20s and 30s who say, I've got lots of expertise and ideas and I can tackle 
something like people dealing with probation challenges or different kinds of things that they, with their day job may not engage them with. But they can figure out a new system to track how the buses come or a new system for, to extend food stamp money or whatever. So I like to measure on cognitive surplus, that's one. The other thing that I think is I, and I'm seriously concerned about this, I don't think we have good mechanisms to create connected tissue in cities. So as diverse as Toronto is, I'm going to give you a highly personal example. As diverse as Toronto is, and as remarkable as it is, who lives here? I have I lived in Toronto for 30 years, and I got married a few years ago, and I looked at our wedding picture, and I was astonished that me, in my business, with 200 people at our wedding, that there wasn't a single person of color at my wedding. I was shocked. Now, to me, that's quite disturbing. Now, there was lots of other diversity in my wedding because I married a woman, so I had that part covered. <laughs> but I did, not have, I did not have the racial ethnic piece covered. And that concerns me as an urbanist, that, that we don't, and I want to, what are the measurements that we can come up with that can tell us whether we're creating more bridges, more connective tissue across neighborhoods, across race, across income. You know, and and I, I don't know what the measure's gonna be on that, and I know that the statisticians want to do the traditional stuff, and all that, but let's challenge ourselves to come up, and I'm still, I'm back at my salmon up the river. What are the things that would tell us that Toronto was really more cohesive, more engaged, more diverse, more healthy, healthy functioning? That would be a great lesson to the world. We're going to come back to it. <laughs> if you're really keen on that, I understand you can phone me on the cell phone, and I'll call you back. We can have a discussion. You'll have better luck than I will pick up apparently returns all the cell phone calls. So you can go do that. Uh, look, on the housing thing, on the on the starts, I understand the concerns around that. I think that I want to go back to there being an opportunity here. And I agree the process isn't right around it. Uh, but, but there are positive aspects to it. And I'm not saying that in each and every case there is going to be a you know, I, I go back to the uh, the Blue Ribbon Fiscal Review Panel that we had with uh, David Miller uh, was there, and I was lucky enough to be asked to be a part of this. And I say lucky because we really got to kick the tire of you know, the city and figure out some of the things that were going on. And one of the ones I zoned in on was Section 37, and I said, look, guys, this money's out there by virtue of this provincial statute, but isn't the idea to pool all this money and actually reallocate it in the city where the needs to raise needed the most? And to use your earlier comment, I was told that dog don't hunt. So if that piece gets unlocked, we've actually started to create the pot that could start to alleviate a lot of these things. Uh, if there's a it's glimmer of hope. It's infinitesimal to the profit on the building. What I'm saying to you is to develop the civic infrastructures of neighborhood associations mm -hmm. and responsive entities that can deliver you a certain, uh, not only policy, but uh, public policy, but uh, people on the ground, meals on wheels. You have got to sort of uh, so let me address the process, the, the process part, and my good friend Paul Bedford makes the same argument all the time, and I agree with him, and in fact, uh, when we had uh, Amanda coming from, from New York and talk about the burden about the, the governance process, you heard me talk a little bit earlier about you know, 21st century city, 1867 governance. It doesn't just work up to the province and the city, but I think we could learn a lot from New York on how to make those decisions come right down into the city and then work their way back up from the grassroots. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity around this piece. I don't think it's perfect in every uh, in every case, but I think, I hate to say this, but on net net, I think it is a positive thing for Toronto to increase that type of density downtown. All right, we're gonna go for just 10 minutes more, but this is where I'm going to put a challenge to the room here, and it, it's no surprise that we're almost at time, given the company I've got up here at the front of the room, the very smart questions we've had from the floor. What I'd like everyone to do here, and really bear with me, because I know this is the moment when people are sometimes inclined to bolt for the exits, is to just turn to the two people to your left and the two people to your right. Make a little cluster of maybe four or five or six people. And in three minutes or so, I want you to talk amongst yourselves, introduce yourselves first, then talk amongst yourselves about what you think the equivalent of the Providence, Rhode Island, uh, fish thing might be for Toronto, or, or less positively, what you think some really bloody-minded, tough visual indicators might also be for the city that we should be watching and tracking. So just quickly turn to the people closest to you, 
talk about some interesting symbols or visual indicators. In three minutes, I'm going to interrupt you, and I'm just going to ask a smattering of people to give us their best idea. Anybody thought that it would get stolen? Well, nobody does. It stays there. The commissioner was at an event and talked about, she learned one of the extra uses was somebody tried to snatch a purse from somebody and went off with it and somebody took on the chairs and knocked the guy over the head with it. So there are all sorts of other things you don't know, you know that the guy uses. I think we should maybe think of Toronto. Like, could we get a little more, loosen up a little bit about that? Like, why don't we create some stuff that can move and not worry about somebody taking a crummy chair and putting it on the dollar? Movable pianos. Movable pianos. Yeah. Look at that piano. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Nobody's stolen those suckers, and they get played all the time. Google yeah, can right. well, last word for us before we wrap up. Anything you'd like to say? I think this has been just you know, five minutes of really interesting exercise, very stimulating stuff that we could spend a whole afternoon talking about properly, and maybe TCF should. Now that I turn the mic off and I lost my voice, uh, this is great stuff. This is great input, by the way. And the most important thing to me is that I think you guys are on your way to helping build a happy city, believe it or not. You've got engaged people here. Uh, you are uh, sensitive to what's going on in the city. And I think everybody kind of goes away with their sense of, you know, how do you know when the city will be happy? Not you, but when the city will. So if you've got ideas about indicators and things like that, keep sending them through to us, too. I think these are things that we certainly want to keep track of. Because I think out there, there is that iconic piece. And I just pains me to say it, I don't want it to be the Stanley Cup. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look for it. We'll look for it perhaps in next year's report. We've got some refreshments here. We hope uh, that you'll stick around, share more of your ideas uh, uh, with us this evening. I want to thank everyone very much for coming on behalf of Young Street Media and the Toronto Community Foundation. We've been fortunate. Uh, to have such an exemplary leader, Raul, producing such an important report that really does give us the pulse of the city. And gosh, we're always fortunate when we've got Mary to come back to Toronto and share, uh, share the benefit of everything that she's working on and, and learning out there. So come back more often, and we hope we'll see you all again soon. This is a series. It will continue. Make sure we have your email address so that we can get in touch when the next event is planned. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful.